But the key issue, I think, for this society is, is there evidence that individuals identified at increased risk due to inflammation benefit from a therapy they otherwise would not have received? And secondly, is there evidence that if we reduce inflammation per se, could we actually imagine a world where that intervention might lower vascular event rates? Now, I'm a cardiologist, so our favorite mode of attack is through lipid reduction. But we showed years ago, this is data from 1998 and 1999, that when we give these very powerful statin drugs, we not only lower cholesterol, we inhibit inflammation. And on the left-hand side of the slide, we show that the number of heart attacks and strokes we prevent is greater when inflammation is present and we give a statin than when inflammation is absent. And on the right-hand side, we showed that you could lower CRP levels. You could inhibit inflammation with these drugs. So fast forward, what did we do? We said, well, who should we treat? And I want you to hold on to these ideas about who to treat in terms of when we get to periodontal disease. Each of these four survival curves is 25% of this audience. Those of you in the red line at the bottom have a high cholesterol and a high CRP. Well, as healthcare providers, hopefully you've seen your internist, hopefully they've screened you for your cholesterol, and hopefully you're probably on diet, exercise, smoking cessation, and probably on a statin. The yellow survival curve in the middle, though, I'm worried about. These are people who have low levels of cholesterol but have the inflammation that your patients have. And they're at higher risk than those in the light blue curve who are already treating. But because they don't have hyperlipidemia, we don't treat them. So we designed a big clinical trial. It happened to be called JUPITER. It's a multinational, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial to address whether or not giving a statin to patients with inflammation can prevent vascular events. So we do this study. We recruit uh, almost 18,000 patients worldwide. We put 6,000 women in to this trial. We have a lot of minority patients. We have a lot of uh, smokers and non-smokers. A very cross-sectional survey that's probably extremely similar to who you see in standard practice. Well, this trial reported out last year and uh, was stopped early by its data safety monitoring board. Because when we gave a statin to people who only had inflammation, we had a 44% reduction in ever getting a future heart attack or stroke. Very narrow confidence intervals, very small p-value, and in fact, a number needed to treat of 25. Now, that's actually smaller, i.e. more efficient than treating hyperlipidemia. So this turns upside down our community's view of are we only going to target in, uh, lipids or are we also going to target inflammation? Because if we're trying to figure out in healthcare how to save cost, the best way to do it is to prevent it in the first place. And so here's a possibility of just under two years cutting our entire angioplasty or bypass surgery rates in half by rethinking the role of inflammation and how this inflammation can be modulated with what turns out to be a very safe and effective therapy. So now we have to rethink who in our population of patients has systemic inflammation? Well, I'm going to argue in a few minutes, your entire practice probably fits this guideline. But the most exciting thing to the cardiovascular community is we had a reduction in all-cause mortality, a 20% reduction in dying from any cause when we gave people with inflammation a statin drug. And for us, that changes how we think about things. Because when we're trying to figure out public health recommendations, when we can say to a patient, Yes, I can lower your risk of heart attack. Yes, I can lower your risk of stroke. And you will live longer. We now have the kind of therapy our patients are willing to take. Relevant to your thinking, and if your patients have oral inflammation, do you want to lower that? Would it benefit? So is the benefit in this trial of a statin based only on lowering the cholesterol, or is it also based on lowering inflammation? And if so, can we imagine other modalities to lower that inflammation? Well, I'll take you through this quickly. We powered this trial on the idea that inflammation had no impact at all. A good scientist has to say, my pet hypothesis is wrong. So the null hypothesis was the benefit we might see would be from lipid lowering alone. And had that been the case, we should have seen about a 25% risk reduction, because that's what cholesterol lowering does. But what we observed was way off the map. Cutting rates in half was not what the cholesterol hypothesis anticipated. So we did a set of analyses, and I just summarized them here in the bottom of the slide. For the patients in this clinical trial, who again would not have gotten this anti-inflammatory therapy, who not only lowered their LDL cholesterol very aggressively, but also lowered their CRP very aggressively, they had a 79% reduction in ever getting a heart attack, a stroke, 
a bypass surgery angioplasty or dying a cardiovascular death. This raises the possibility that lowering inflammation per se beyond just the benefits of these drugs for lowering cholesterol might well open up a new way of thinking about prevention of heart disease, which at the end of the day still kills half of us in a Western society. So now the tension in this field changes. If we can convince the primary care community and the cardiovascular community that the way to get at vascular prevention is both through lipid reduction and inflammation inhibition, we have to begin asking questions. Can targeted anti-inflammatory therapy reduce cardiovascular risk? Well, I've only given you a little bit of data about aspirin and statins, but there's many different ways we could go about inhibiting inflammation. Dr. Corman himself is involved in many different studies looking at ways to inhibit interleukins, as an example. There are many interesting drugs that have been developed to block leukotriene production, to uh, block chemokinase and, 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 and issues. And we have a lot of ways to get there. It is so exciting to me to see the periodontal community thinking about this, to see the arthritis community thinking about this, to see our dermatology colleagues thinking about this, because we do believe this is the way to beat this disease. So I'm going to end with a pitch for the cardiovascular community and then a pitch for you. The cardiovascular community has to move forward. In 1961, colleagues just 20 miles west of here in Framingham, Massachusetts, defined older age, male gender, diabetes, hypertension, smoking as major cardiovascular risk factors. 1961. Well, we know this disease is more complicated than that. And we in the cardiovascular community have to move forward beyond these major risk factors to understand what's going on. So I want to leave you with a real challenge then. If this is a difficult issue to hold on to, this notion that maybe there's something fundamental out there that we've missed, then I would argue the reason you're opening speaker tonight as a cardiologist is because I, what I really want you to do is to do something that Bob Genko tried to do several years ago, but the time is right now. Can improved periodontal care reduce cardiovascular risk? We don't know the answer to that. But the biology of this disease makes sense to me as a cardiologist. The idea that improved tooth health, and again, what I mean by that is saving teeth and performing the kinds of things that you as a community can do to reduce the burden of the inflammation in the oral cavity. There's enough biology at this time to say, can a randomized trial be supported by the NIH to actually bring it to a forefront? Is it possible? that one of the keys to preventing cardiovascular disease lies right in this society. So my real reason for wanting to be here tonight was to say, I think my group and this group need to think through this process because a randomized trial taking high-risk patients with periodontal disease, improving it in some, natural history in the others, and if the cardiovascular event rates came down, well, two things would happen. One is we would have done a great thing for society and the second thing is the controversy about whether or not this has value would be over. And the only way to get there, I think, is through randomized trials. So Dr. Cochran, Dr. Corman, members of the board, members of society, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and welcome to Boston.